This is a Parsha podcast brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study, and I'm your host, Yosefa Fogel Rubel. Let's learn. Welcome back to our Breshit series, These Are Our Heroes, where we're exploring with our guests a central figure from each Parsha, asking them what is meaningful, inspiring, powerful, challenging, and thought-provoking about their behaviors. This podcast is dedicated by the Yellen and Weingarten families in loving memory of Judy Yellen, Yehudit Masha Bat Eliezer Vechava, on her 30th yard site, which will be on Tet Cheshvan. Bright, charismatic, and devoted to family and friends, Judy touched the lives of many. She was passionate about Israel, and she moved here and pursued a law career until her passing in 1994 at the age of 33. For those of you who love listening weekly, sponsoring an episode is a wonderful way to show your gratitude for the high-level content we try and put out each week. For more information, contact me at podcast at matan.org.il or the Matan office. Parshat Vayera opens with Sarah's receival of the news of Yitzchak's future birth, which is the first revelatory stop on the travel route of the three messengers of God, after which they continue to stone and deliver God's punishment and save Lot and his family. Avraham then engages in a divine debate, arguing with God's attribute of judgment. Then Yitzchak is born, and we are thrown into a whirlwind of narratives. His youth is complicated by the presence of Ishmael, who gets thrown out of Avraham's house with his, with his mother Hagar. It's a strikingly similar yet somewhat different story than the one told in chapter 16, which takes place before Sarah is a mother. There's a brief reprieve to discuss stolen wells, and Avraham flexes his muscles as arbitrator, creating an alliance with Avimelech and his army chief. Right after this, God commands Avraham to sacrifice his son. Today, I am joined by our new guest, Michal Porat Zibman, who has been teaching at the seminary Midrashat Moriah for the past 20 years and at Mechon Mayan for the past five. Michal regularly guides student and adult delegations to Poland and is on the administration of Camp Hask. Michal, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. It is wonderful to be here. I'm very excited because we've been doing podcasts now for three years. We're at episode, I think, 190. And we have Most never tough. yet done sort of a portrait of Sari Emenu, which is essentially what we want to do today, right? Okay. Our, our series theme, are these are our heroes. And today we're going to sort of dig deeper into Sari Emenu as a hero of Am Yisrael and sort of explore the different dimensions that are brought to us. So where do you want to start this exploration of Sarah? Her first introduction is take two parts you to go. It's not in Parsha. You know, her main role takes place in Lecha and mostly Vayera, but in the end of Parsha Noach, she's mentioned, and I think it often gets, like, sidetracked because the Noach story between the Mabul and between Migdal Bava, like, that's, like, the main discussion there. Then at the very end of Parsha Noach, the Torah tells us, Vayikach Avram v'nachor l'hem nashim, shem eshet Avram sarai, v'shem eshet nachor melka, ben harabat haran, avi melka avi melka avi yiska. Then there's another piece to this. It's not just that we're introduced to her name. There's, like, a description, Vati Sarah Akara in Lavalad. And Sarah was barren and she had no children, which at first glance, and maybe even at eternal glance, I don't know, it, it, it's so such a strange thing to say about someone. We're, we're projecting the woman that is going to be the matriarch of the Jewish people, one of the, uh, the first of the uh, Imahot, and, and that's how you describe her? Like, that's, that's her resume? It's, it, 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 seems, it seems to me a little bit uncomfortable at first. On the other hand, there's something beautiful, thinking ahead to all the Imahot that are introduced at a younger age. You know, this one was Midrash, she was this, she was three, she was, she's introduced as an adult. She's introduced, we don't know anything about her background. Checks to pose that with like, Noach ish tzaddik to me, and I think that Sarah's introduction is just like an adult. And this is where she becomes who she's, her destiny is, is later on in life. It's not in her earlier years. Mm-hmm. And there's something so beautiful about that, because I think we get caught up in like the stories of great people that when they were little, they were doing this and they were doing that. And then here's people, we don't, we don't know what she did. Maybe she was wonderful. Maybe she was a not wonderful. Um, but her, her glory is in her adult years. And, and even coming here this morning, like I was sitting on a bench as everybody was coming in, just watching all these adults come to Matan, I was just thinking, like, this is so beautiful. Like, at all age, you know, your connection to Torah, your connection to, it doesn't matter what, not that it doesn't matter what people did beforehand, you know, I'm sure people here have wonderful resumes, but mm-hmm. just the, the concept of, okay, what if I didn't start earlier on? What if I wasn't doing that? So two, two thoughts in response to that. The first is that I often say that same idea when it comes to Moshe. I always say he had a full life until he was 80, but 
his big career break was, was when he was 80. Which you never really think about also. Which you don't think about it. And you don't think about Moshe as an evolving personality that maybe ha he had to evolve. I Meaning as a leader, he certainly evolves that when we meet him at 80. But I, I think about that often, that you know we live in a world where there's a lot of emphasis on you know, having early breaks and you have to have a startup and your first startup by the time you're 30. And I'm not saying that that's not true. It's also because the, the, the time frame and the, the rhythm of technology is much faster than human rhythms actually are. And that's what creates a lot of times the stress between tech technology and how we actually function and develop. But I think that's such a meaningful point, right? That people, sometimes our best chapter is, is still ahead of us. And the other piece I just wanted to say in response to meeting Sarah as someone who's barren, not only is it a significant piece of information because ultimately she's supposed to be a matriarch and this is clearly going to be her biggest life hiccup, but it also tells us the following. We already learned that marital relationships can go awry. We learned that from the story of Adam and Chava. We already learned that parent-child relationships can go awry. We learned that from Noach and his sons. And I feel that when we meet Avram and Sarah, or Sarai, it's where we first meet the idea that we might have had all of these lists of all these generations that were begat, but this is where we meet the, for the first time this idea that that also can go awry and that there is nothing promised it will be promised to have a child. There's nothing, it's no, it's no given that children will just be born. And so it's such an, I think it's painful, but. It's painful, but it's also in terms of a marriage. A, a marriage can be successful. They were, they were partners at that stage. And a marriage can be successful with, without yet having children. And, and yes, children are, are the biggest brachat in Jewish family. But, but we're, I mean, if we're all honest with ourselves, we all know people. We're living in a world where that doesn't come easy to everyone. It doesn't mm -hmm. come simply to everyone. Yeah. And that feeling of I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worth it. But am I really doing what I'm supposed to do? And here you meet Sarah, and the, and the Torah says you can have a beautiful partnership, you can have a beautiful relationship, you can have a beautiful marriage, you can be successful. I want to say professional because I want to use about Sarah, but you can be successful in what you do and what you engage in before you have children or yeah. not yet having children. Which is, you know, I don't know. Maybe it sounds a lot like suit, but like. No, I mean, I also think I've brought it up in past podcasts, but there's that commentary of the Akedat Yitzchak where he speaks about you have you have Em Kol Chai and you also have the the Isha. He brings it up. Rav Salvechik invokes this idea also in Family Redeemed. But there are two different there are two, two different, different roles. roles, and nobody wants to give up on either of them. But what he says, and he says it specifically when it comes to Rachel, when she later says Im Ayin Meta Anochi, that. He, what he claims is that what, what Yaakov is trying to say to her is you still have a whole other dimension to your life. Okay. Now, obviously there's tremendous challenge and nobody here is minimizing the emotional challenge that infertility brings up. And I think that part of what's jarring about the presentation of Sarah is that I would say in our first meeting with her, we may, we might want to feel like there's another characteristic of her, right? The first thing we know is just that she's married and that she doesn't have children. There's some, I think the jarring piece is that like, is that how we're going to characterize her? Correct. And, and she is the, we, we know that she's going to be one of the mothers. So like yeah. that we meet her before almost her greatest career is, is before that. Yeah. Um, and it's in, uh, Rav Moshe Chaim Lau, uh, Shami Kom Demo, whose yard site is the 11th day of Cheshvan, which is the week that we had Parsha Vieira. So in his piece, he has a, I mean, he was murdered in the Holocaust in Treblinka, but he has a piece on different aspects of Tanakh and his piece on Sari Menu is that, is that the, the gift that Tanakh gives us with Sari Menu is that we don't know who she was as a child, mm. is that it's older and that, Age doesn't need to limit your capabilities, and age doesn't need to limit your 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 contribution to the world. And, and that's the first lesson of Sarmina, which is something else that I that, that that I love. That as she gets older, her character becomes more and more. Yeah, it's her high. You know, the other Imahot that start when they're younger. That's when their characters are. That's when they yeah. shine. She mm -hmm. shines, you know, later. So I like I like that. That's where I would begin my powerful understanding or connection or even interest in 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 who she is and who she was. Yeah. And so what's our, what's our next step on that, on that portraiture it's, train? It, I think that when you watch her character development, there's so much emotion there, right? There's so much, that, you know, the Tanakh, which is like very limited on like the stories of emotion, but here we have someone who is, um, who's, who's supportive of her husband and agrees with her husband. And yet, you know, she's this strong character. And when the Hagar situation comes, it's like a flip side of her. It's like a complete, like she's angry, she's jealous, she's, she's yeah. aggressive. Yeah. And again, at first glance, you look at it and you're like, wait, this is not the story that we know. Mitsachini, that's like the most human trait of all. What, we don't get jealous of things at, or people. We don't get angry at our spouses about things. We don't have challenges. We don't have strife with our spouses. So to portray that and to highlight that and to say she was, what made her exceptional was not that she was void of all human emotions. It's, mm -hmm. it's 
that she had all those human emotions that are so raw and so vulnerable and that's not portrays them like that story does not need to be portrayed like it's somewhat you could yeah. say why did why did not choose to tell that story like about sorry Manu. but there is something in that in that her voice is so dominant in that story right like i i don't want i don't want uh you know i, I don't want her hug our hair like it's hard I, for me that she has and then later on again right it's hard for me that it's the influence of my son but even before she it's like is born it's the yeah the first thing you touched upon right now is this idea that Sefer Breshit brings us troubled family dynamics. This is a, this is a topic we explored in depth, uh, again, two years ago on the podcast. I always say I would, I would talk about it every year. But, uh, but this idea that the Torah mostly brings us the sticky stories, and it, it, it doesn't bring us usually the smooth stories, because ultimately through that like very human array of emotion, we get to know our biblical figures. At uh, once it humanizes them, and the other we still have to figure out what it is about them that really elevates them and transcends those the human sides to them. The 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 other piece I just want to say in response to specifically regarding Hagar or sort of the docile nature of how we see Sarah in going down to Egypt and playing along with Avram's plan, which to us feels difficult morally, versus her outspokenness in terms of the home, is that I think that it's very much about where do people have vision about what, right? If somebody has a vision about how something should be, so we tend to be more vocal about it. We meet Sarah is somebody who has a strong vision about how she wants her home to function, who she wants to be there, what kind of influences she wants there. Do I wanna live in a home where my where the secondary wife there is somebody who doesn't respect me? Like it's She very much has a sense of what kind of environment and atmosphere she wants in her home. In the case of Avraham in Egypt, that seems to have that's that wasn't the realm in which she was the one who decided the vision. And we could divide it sort of like gender stereotypically, but I think that we don't ha even have to go there. You don't have to go there, but even even within that, like the fact that she even suggested in the first place to Avraham, right? There's something noble about that. There's something mm -hmm. heroic about that. Like, what is my vision for my home? Yeah. That, that Avraham should be a father. But often the visions that we have and the generosity that we have when it comes down to reality is not always as glorious as the suggestion yeah. itself. Yeah. Could, which is something that I definitely, you know, I can think about, like, you know, we, we make these suggestions or volunteer to do things. And then, like, it happens, and you're like, wait a minute. So even in Sarah's suggestion, which is so, like, self-negating, like, take another yeah. wife. That then is taken by the other Imahot in two generations later, right? Yulea and Rachel do the same thing. Right, right. That's what, like, where that repeats, that whole concept repeats itself later. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's not necessarily, you know, move away from that family, the... I don't know, the uh, not showing family dynamic or the family. This is more like the the individual and, like, what... For those, you know, when you when you think about the family dynamics, that speaks to many people. But many people don't have families. So, 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 so the Tanakh is not only calling out to like anyone who's married, anyone who's a mother, but the Tanakh is calling out to that individual. What are we as females? It's also a female character trait, which is bala debutoy. It expresses itself in a marriage, but it's also just can be just a female trait of that we or a trait of a woman that we that we make these. You know, can we really back up that which we do or or. Is our vision not always meet reality? Do we build castles in the in the air um, without without those foundations? But I think it 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 gives her like this insight. It gives us this insight into this woman of of complicated emotions, mm -hmm. not of you know not of a certain stereotype, but uh, it can move in many different directions. Which would take me to the next piece of her. It's sort of like a hidden place where she is, right? In the beginning of our Parsha and Parsha Vayera, when they come, when these three messengers come to, to Avram and he's sitting outside the tent, which is always a strike. I know my daughter was born in the, the, for, for this week's Parsha and I remember like being in the hospital reading that story and it was so, it was, it stood out to me so much. Like Most people read the Parsha while they've just, after they've just given birth. <laughs> yeah, most people do that. No, 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 no. It's like, I know friends who did that. Fiomi, it's all good. Clearly most women do this. It's because, you know, you, when you, first of all, when you have a girl, you don't have a bris, so you have to like, you know, think about, you have to like create your own narrative and without a tech guess, so you have to make up your own tech guess. yeah but, I've, made up, um, I've made up a lot of those yeah but um oh, that's a conversation we should have a different time we could have the, that conversation yeah um of, of you know of, of sitting outside the tent and 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 Rav Hirsch has this whole piece about Avram that he's why is he sitting outside the tent to show that the Brit Milah that I had is not going to separate me it's going to make me part of the part of the world and then these Malachim come and they talk to Avram and they say right so Sarah's not supposed to be there, but what does the Tanakh tell us about where Sarah actually is? You know, Sarah Shomat Petach Ohel, that's mm -hmm. what the Tanakh says. It's such a it's such a beautiful narrative. It's like Sarah wasn't this passive woman, like hiding, like not part of things. She's like, no, I need to know what's going on. But maybe my place is not to be outside with Avram and these people. And then that that brings her like this other, like, I don't know, this it, it's it's it, it's her taking initiative and not just being passive and waiting for Avram. And then we have this story which i don't think needs to be in the tanakh but that's why it's so interesting to me of sarah's response why is sarah's response so important to the story because she laughs 
Laughter is not a common theme in the Tanakh. I don't know, you have your doctor. You can tell me if laughter is a common theme in the Tanakh. Nope. And, um, and she laughs. And then there's this, you know, Hashem said, you know, it's almost, almost like Hashem gets insulted by Sarah's laugh. Almost. Mm-hmm. Like, what, what does she do? What, how could she? How does that say Sarah? Meaning, HaKadosh Baruch himself is, is like, her, her opinion matters to him almost. Mm-hmm. Like, her response matters to him. But it's when she names him, which I think, to me, is so... It's so powerful because she doesn't name him. What does she when she when he is born, and she names him right? What does she name him? She names him Yitzchak because Kol um, Yitzchakli, right? It's not. I'm not naming him. I always thought until really recently. I always thought that she named him Yitzchak after her own laugh. Like remember the time that I laughed, but it's not. It's Kol Hashomay Yitzchakli. Anyone who hears about this, well, I want everyone to join in my joy and everyone to join in my awe. Of, 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 of the fact that I was able to c- conceive a child at this age and, and deliver a child at this age, meaning there's like a sense of humor about her that's somewhat self-deprecating, but it's, it's I, I love that because it's not stereotypical and it's not like there's a simcha and there, there's a joy in there. It's kol shimer, like for the rest of eternity, everyone, I want everyone to laugh with me, mm-hmm. right? It's taking a moment that you might be ashamed about and then like being, not metakein it, but maybe being ma'alet. I know it sounds a little bit rough cookie about like, rough cook, rough cookie in about like fixing something in the past. So maybe, maybe that reaction of laughter and Hashem being, she's like, no, 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 I want this to be beautiful. I want us always to be, laughter is an expression of awe, of an emotion that I can't, for all times, call Hashomea Yitzchakli and not, you know, Tzachakti, you know, nine months ago. It's interesting because the name Yitzchak, first of all, it's decided Merosh, right? It's told to Avram that he's going to have a child and he's going to be called Yitzchak. And then the stories that come after sort of confirm why that that's why that's a why good name. Um, again, that's the way the stories are presented to us in the Tanakh as, as we have it. So it's a it's a predetermined name. And then what I think what we can take from these stories is that there's so many reasons why this was the right name. Meaning, there's the, she her response, how she wants to then memorialize her response, as you said, to have people join in with her. That out of tzchok of simcha, as opposed to making fun of, right? She wants everyone to be joyful with her. Um, and I think that part of what it tr- comes to say is that the the name that a child is given it can be named for multiple things at the same time. It could be both like something that's like predetermined or predestined. It could be a combination of the emotional space of the parent at that time. And it also may be reflective of the nature of the child a- as as it will develop. But like there's sort of like multi, it's like a multidimensional um, source for the name Yitzchak. <laughs> Uh, and I think that I always wonder, meaning, what what comes before what? Like, did she know his name was supposed to be Yitzchak? Like that, and then she gave a reason for that. Yeah, other. meaning, I, I tend to think that that's what was. Like, she knew that that was supposed to be the name, and then she's like, oh, that's so interesting, because it actually really fits into the scenario in which this whole thing played out. Um, I always but, thought of it as like, that was the name, and then she says, no, it's going to be, I'm going to add to that, which mm-hmm. is very true what you say. Yeah. Like, the emotions, when you name a child, there's a lot of different yeah. pieces to it. It's not just like, one, it, it's... It brings up so many different thoughts, but the fact that she's able to take it out of her personal space and invite all others yeah. in, which is, again, the word I keep thinking about sermon is inviting. And I think she is trying to repair something because when she's called out on her laughter earlier, she feels a need to defend herself and, and to say, no, 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 I didn't really laugh, right? Which is its own question. Why? Right. What is that white lie? But I think that you see the tikkun, I think that was the right, the repair is the right word, where she says, whatever that laugh was then, now I want to, I want to, transform it into something else. I want to transform it into sort of a plea, into a, a wonder that this actually has come to be. And I think that it is, like we could do a whole drasha here just on like, what is laughter as a response? Do you know what I'm saying? And I think that she covers a whole bunch of the angles of what laughter can be just throughout these these few these few snippets of the story. And again, it's it's not necessary to the narrative. No. But it's it's there and, and but it, it just strengthens the 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 suitability of his name. Meaning yes. when you read the stories, it says, oh, this really was the right name that God gave to Abraham already for Perkim ago. Like this was supposed to be his name. And I also think there's something in there that allows us to reframe our own narratives, right? If someone's going through a struggle and they're very angry at God, and then when things turn around, hopefully for them later on, and when you tell your narrative, that piece of like, and I used to be, I used to be so angry. It's no longer, it's not, it's like, you know, when they say like, uh, when a wound becomes a scar, when it was something in the past, right? So often when, even in questions of Emuna and definitely now when there's anger and frustration, when that becomes a part of our narrative to later on that I was once in a dark place and now I'm in a mm-hmm. better yeah. place, it, it enables us to, to lift up that darkness. And I think that's what she does. Not, she's not lifting up darkness, she's lifting up 
yeah. shame or embarrassment. At I think I think it's, it's a yeah, it's a reframe of that of that scenario. And I think in this case, I don't think she would. I, I think her infertility was her was her first wound. Meaning, you see the pain of it from the way she responds to Hagar. Um, but I think that in this case, she's she's reframing a way that she responded, and we could do that often. I mean, I would even say on a basic level, like sometimes we'll retell a story. And we'll slightly shift the way we retell it because we didn't love the way it went down. <laughs> oh, so that's the difference. She did it on purpose. Like she didn't like yeah. the rent, so she she yeah. like shifts. That's yeah, true. Shifts it. It's like it's a natural instinct. I, I'm I'm sorry, but it's happened to me before. Where like you like change slightly a fact to align it with the way you kind of wanted that's it to work true. out, uh, and it, it happens. Okay, so so what's our our next stop on the on the Sarah journey? <sighs> The next step on the Sarah journey is, is like a, it's almost like an ironic step on the Sarah journey because it's where we most expect her and where she's most absent. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you, which is the story, you know, it's, it's like intimidating right now in this time of where we are in, uh, in the land of Israel and in the world to, to talk about the Akedah, right? It's, it's, it's the topic that you can't talk about. It's the topic that you can't avoid. Mm -hmm. And so every... Up until recently, the Akeda was always like a theological discussion like you could have, even if as a parent you think of it a little differently. There's no question that we read it differently now. So I just want to give it space to that piece of like, I, I, the Akeda no longer seems as like, not that it ever really was, but like another biblical narrative. It, we connect to it on a much more, much more profound level. But right before the Akeda, when, when Yitzchak is, uh, when Yitzchak and Yishmael are already boys, and the effect that Yishmael's having on, uh, on, on, on Yitzchak is very apparent, and Sarah's voice is so dominant there, to the extent that even God, Hashem himself refers to it, Kola Asher Tamar Lecha, Sarah Shema Bakola, like, listen to her voice. And Avram has no voice in that story. Avram mm -hmm. is, you know, he doesn't want to, but he doesn't, he doesn't speak. And then we have this story that is so painful, and so complicated and so challenging, and you would think that the, the, the mother that that the mother the, the mother who should be there not only should she be there, but a story ago she was bothered by influence in the house, and she's you know takes this dramatic step, and then you have the story of Yitzhak leaving the house forever, and it's completely absent. Mm -hmm. the, the Akeda Yitzhak is a story of Avram and Yitzhak, and Sarah's voice, which we need, which we're so desperate for, which we. Again, I've never really framed it like that in my mind until literally last year when we were so when we read the Akeda right in the beginning, and we're like, wh "Where is that mother? Wh wh where is where is her voice? What did she say? Was she compliant?" And then you start looking at the Makarot, and it's almost like everybody notices it, and yeah. everybody addresses it, and it's lacking for everyone. And to me, the real question, which I don't know if anyone has an answer to, is why did the Tanakh choose to? Why does the Torah choose to? remove her from that before we go into some of the explanations that the parshanim offer regarding her absence i just want to say that the same idea comes up when it comes to rachel passing away and the story of yosef and his brothers i, I don't remember where i read it but the idea that that whole thing likely wouldn't have gone down the way it did if rachel had been around meaning there was something about the fact that the boys were kind of yosef specifically was kind of left vulnerable without the protection and love of somebody else in the home i think they're also she's she's not there because she's she passed away but um but in that case also there's sort of that that pe there's that absence the other thing that also came to mind as you were describing that is that first of all i'm thinking of Hana being somebody who who sacrifices her son in air quotes and sends him to the Mishkan. There's also, there's like a moment when she brings her son there that always makes my heart kind of like hurt because I'm, but she, she worked so hard for that son and now and she's dedicating him to the Mikdash. So it's not sacrificed in the sense of killing, but there's, there's to me, there's like a, almost like a, a sequel to this. Of, here's a woman who, Dafka is the one who brings her son. She is the one who had the vision. She made it happen and she brings him to the Mishkan. But even in that story, it doesn't happen right away, right? El Kana wants yes. to take when it's like Adi yes. like she wants to hold on to him. Yeah. So we Keeps see that mother yeah. connection, which which we don't have anything from Sarah. We just yes. it's almost as if she's yeah. non doesn't exist. It brings me back though to the way you portray the earlier narratives of that there are narratives where she's dominant and narratives where Abraham is dominant, right? Meaning in the Mitraim story, she's I would say she's the object almost of the narrative. And in the Hagar stories, she is the the main the main uh, the main voice the main. the main voice there. And and in this case, it feels like you know in the world of uh, Abraham's relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu, this is 
this is his space. Even earlier, the Rit Ben Aptarim is given just to Avraham. The Psora of having a child is first given just to Avraham, meaning there, there's something here where I feel like the Hafradat Roshayot, like the separation of powers or, 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 or of involvement, have been made clear before. It doesn't minimize the question we have about where Sarah is, especially in light of what happens but, after. But but it does highlight even how I think couples function, right? In, yeah. in, 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 a, in a, you know, many families, and, that, that there are roles that the the father plays a more dominant role. There are situations where, and there are situations where the where the parent where the mother plays the more dominant role in certain situations, certain things. And that but here it's a combination of that child and Avram's relationship with God. So it feels even more difficult that Sarah is not there. It, it feels everything about it feels difficult. Yeah, you know, Sarah was the yeah, it's like was their journey together. Yeah, and then and then she's taken out, and then she's taken out. So how do the commentators look at this absence? So, you know, her story spans in so many parashiot, and then the, the, the story that happens right after Akira Yitzchak is, is the beginning of Parsha Chai Sarah, which is that, that Sarah dies. And the, the Torah emphasizes that Sarah, I mean, it doesn't, it's obvious that she dies in Hebron. And that leads a lot of the parashitim to say, wait, 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 why did she die in Hebron? Right? Avram leaves to the Akedah from Beersheba. And then Avram goes back to Beersheba at the end of the Akedah, mm -hmm. right? He comes back, you know, with Yitzchak, without Yitzchak is a different question. And why does Sarah die in Hebron? Why is she not there when he comes back? And the Midrashim do talk about the fact that why was it why was it connected that that the Akeda had such an effect on her, or the thought of the Akeda, or the rumor of the Akeda that that she died. Now, why does she die in Hebron? So, so the truth is, I think that, that the Nitziv. I remember hearing this actually from S. D. Rosenberg, Rebbein S. D. Rosenberg, so many years ago, and I remember just it's such a visual thought that where Beersheba is down south. And Avram wakes up, the Nitziv says that Yaakov wake, that Avram wakes up in the morning to take Yitzchak, and then Sarah is like, where are they going? And she, she runs after him. Right? She runs after him, she, she follows him. And he gets to Yerushalayim before them, and she gets to Hebron, which is in between Beresheva and Yerushalayim, and then she sees what happens. And, and it's almost as if they, she had an emotional, not almost as if, that she had a heart attack of some sort. Right? That's what the Midrashim said, that she, that she died, that there was a direct oh, connection, right? There's mm -hmm. a direct connection between the rumor of a kid at Yitzchak and her death. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think in the earlier commentaries, right, it's, just, it's, it, it's more described as the pain of an emotion. Why isn't her voice there? It seems as if no one thought to tell her. Now, why does no one think to tell her? I think there's something there about the fact that the last time God Hashem addresses addresses Sarah's voice to Avram, it's in the story before with Hagar, where Avram says Hashem says, "Call her tomorrow, uh, Sarah Shema Bakola. and maybe he's nervous that if he tells her, she's going to say no, and maybe Avram is caught in his own mind between do I tell my wife or do I listen to Hashem? The last thing Hashem told me was listen to her, and I I can't talk to her right now because she's mm -hmm. going to persuade me out of it, mm -hmm. right? Those things that spouses do that I, I can't tell my spouse about this right now because. I need to do this, and maybe he'll stop me for whatever reason. So perhaps that's why he he stops. He doesn't tell her at all. Um, but 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 there, but when you later, as you enter the uh, commentary world a little bit later on, it seems a little bit more complicated than that. It wasn't just that she heard about it and then she died, right? It wasn't just that she had this emotional reaction. It's it's. What what happened to them? What happened to her as a mother? What happened to her? What happened to her as a wife? Um, and yesterday was the year site of the uh, of the Ish Kodesh of uh, of Piasechna of Klonis Chaim Shapir of Piasechna, who was who was a rav in Warsaw in Piasechna before World War II, and then in the Warsaw Ghetto, and then he was killed in the Shoah. And his dress shirt, which are very well known as the Ish, uh, known as the Ish Kodesh, even though if you met him in his lifetime and you called him the Ish Kodesh, he wouldn't, he wouldn't know, have he wouldn't have known that, that about himself. Yeah. And um, and and what he's and 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 how does he look at you know the Akira Yitzchak and how does he look at, uh, at, at how does he look at the death of uh, of Sarah and and the Ish Kodesh really says that that there are certain nisyonot lo yechal ispol yisurim kashim umikol shekin anachnu that's the bottom line of of what we said that the whole story of Sarah's absence and voice and 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 then connecting her death to it is literally to show is to show Hashem to show us there are certain nisyonot that we can't handle. Mm -hmm. That a mother, parent, a mother, losing her son, it, she couldn't go back to herself. And in a, in a I don't know, in, in, in a real, very real way today, I think it's such, an, it's such a loud narrative for us. We are surrounded today, surrounded, in every, especially in the last two weeks, every, 
אין קהילה של אין בבית, in our community mm-hmm. and in the larger Jewish community, reminds us to be so careful, so careful with those who have experienced loss, yeah. that even if they may portray a certain gura about them, what the Eish Kodesh says is so real, that, that reminding us that when you experience the loss of your, of your child, you're never going to go back to being who you were. Mm-hmm. Now that's on a personal level. Rav Meidan and Rav Amnon Bazak from Yeshivat Har Tzion in a, one of their clips of Chidush Me'agush, um, where they talk about different inyanim of, uh, of the Parsha. It's highly recommended. They're it's excellent. Stuff. Yeah, they're excellent. So in there, I think it's 2021, I think it was from that one, where they talk about why Sarah dies in Hebron. And Rav Meidan says it's not possible that Sarah was alive during the Akedah and this happened. It's, it doesn't right. make he, he any sense. You can't conceive of that being a possibility. Not a chance. Yes. So he says that the whole story of the Akedah happens after mm-hmm. Sarah dies. Which means going against the Pshat. Which is totally going against yeah. the Pshat, but, uh-huh. but sort of making everything live harmoniously. Yeah. And maybe also reminds me a little bit of what you said about Rachel and Yosef, that, though, that that story could have only yeah. happened if she wasn't around. Yeah. And Rav Bazak says something which is so radical to me, and I don't even know how I feel. I don't even know how I feel about mentioning it. Maybe you'll edit it out, but like Rav Bazak says, the Pshat is that when Avram went back to Beersheba, Sarah wasn't there because she... Their, their relationship wasn't the same anymore. Right. He says almost maybe they were separated. I think he pretty yeah. much indicates that they were yeah. separated. Now, you don't have to go even that far. Yeah. Right? Did she pick up her stuff, pack her suitcase, and leave? Or did she just not want to be at home when he came home? Mm-hmm. Which I think is a little bit softer yeah. in terms of that relationship. Like, you can look yeah. at that relationship. You can look at that piece of her dying in Hebron mm-hmm. while he's in Beersheba and say, she, as I think Rav Bazak says, he left, she left the house. She could not live with him again. Yeah. And they were separated, which also touches upon that inviting piece of not every marriage not the, the not every marriage ends in harmony even though yeah. theirs does have a harmony in the end in terms of the burial but we'll get that to in a second but i think even if you say like she, she couldn't be home like there are times when we are so frustrated with our, our whoever it is our spouse or and, and you're like i don't want to be here when they get here like mm-hmm. i can't face them yeah. so i would like to believe that she goes down to Hebron to be the cover of adam and, uh, and chava where she goes down to connect and, she happen- and then she dies out of a heart attack, but she doesn't leave him. Mm-hmm. She just needs a break. How, that, there has to be room for that in the Torah, that, that sometimes as partners as they were, and they were so together and everything, they, there were times when they couldn't be together. Yeah. I, I think also specifically surrounding loss, one of the things that I know people are told from having people close to my life who have lost children uh, one of the first things that they're told is, please be aware that you and your spouse will not mourn in the same way. Meaning you have to l- create space for everybody to respond differently. And that might also be sitting at the root of this. Meaning there was sort of like a space created for each of them. Now in the end, it didn't come to pass and he, he wasn't sacrificed, but it was almost like this understanding that we are not going to meet this challenge in the same way. Um, again, maybe in the case, in this case where she literally just, she couldn't, she couldn't get past this moment, but it sort of, to me, creates this like parallel, this parallel picture of like, there's the way Avram's going to deal with it and the way that Sarah's going to deal with it. And I'll take that and I'll say not only parallel this way, but parallel in the future. If Sarah's voice would have been added to the story of the Akeda, it would set a paradigm for how mother is supposed to respond to mm-hmm. the Messiah Nefesh of her son, which would be... I don't want to say unfair, but it would, it, would, it would bind us to that a little bit. What if she pr- protested? What if she said, wonderful? What if she said, this is great? Then we would all feel like every time in our days, every time a mother drives her child to the army base, and every time a mother takes her son you know, re- back to the army, and, and, and that would how I would understand today, that idea of going out towards Monsieur Nefesh, or every time, even if you put away that piece of taking him there, every time a parent experiences the loss or potential loss, because in this case it was the potential loss of her child, Everyone is going to experience that differently. Sarah and Avram were going to experience it differently. And Sarah and every other mother in history is going to experience that differently. Yeah. And we have that in our society. We have the mothers who are very outspoken. We have the mothers that are not outspoken. And, yeah. and not to think it has to be this way or that way. And, and maybe that's, you know, you, you want to always have a different relationship with Torah. And you want the Torah to seem different to you. And for years, it's bothered me. I always thought it was so. In the last two years, I just think it's such a, it's not a pleasant gift, but it's such a, um, I don't even know what the word is. It's a, uh, it's a. You don't, appreciate the space that's you, created you by the la- her by lack the of involvement. Space. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't bind you. Then there are going to be the Avrams, you yeah. know, getting up in the morning and doing what. Yeah, but even that, I want to say is, I think that this theory fits also for Avraham because one of the questions we have is, 
how do you understand Avraham's state, emotional state, he while this is happening? And, then he doesn't and, and, and honestly, in my opinion, according to the Peshat, putting Vayashkem Baboker on the side, is that there's, there's maybe there's an alacrity, but there's not a, a positivity, meaning there is something very goal oriented about the way Avraham behaves with, with Yitzchak. Meaning, I do, I, I dafka read it as Avraham is as, is as poker faced as he can be while this thing is happening. Now, I think that might be uh, an expectation of a mother that is simply impossible. Meaning, and therefore, not only is she not leading him to the Akedah because this is this conversation between God and Avraham, but I think that paradigmatically, it's it's not it's not the right person to be there. Meaning, Avraham can maybe be poker faced, which I think he is in the shot. Again, there's debates about that. Maybe you should you can see that he's ready and he's willing, and even Yitzhak understands implicitly what's about to happen in the way that they speak. And there's lots of lots of ink that's been spilled on this topic, but. I think that paradigmatically, it wouldn't work for a woman to be involved in this in this scene. Like it, it, it wouldn't be realistic without taking away from a father's pain. Meaning, correct, father being portrayed correct. with Dafka without a voice there either. Yeah, to also set a paradigm. There's of a submission there. There's there's a certain just submission, submission to the will of God. It's not, of course, there's emotion, but the emotion seems to be suppressed um, temporarily in in the scenario. And I think that there's that expectation simply isn't going to be placed on the the mother in this in this story it's not going to be but it, but it's again this this absence draws us in once yeah. you, when, if you've just met sarah Emenu right before the akeda then okay but if yeah. you've been following sarah's you know narrative how since day one in, how, this, in yeah, each other and in, in their family yeah and and, and their death, the death and the separation of them is very jarring and i think it's important that none of none of the commentaries hide behind it yeah. Right. They might say, no, it's out of order. It's this, it's that. You know, it, it's uh, it's not what you think it is. Um, the Ramban says, what are you talking about? He went to Be'er Sheva, then together they went to Hebron. Right. Mm -hmm. They were they were both there together. Tachini, she she doesn't die in the place that he, he returns to someplace and she's not there. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find myself like in the middle of, of her needing a break, of her needing some space. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Sometimes we need space when when there's when 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 those difficult things happen. Um, you hinted something about, about their burial. Do you so I, I also think that, that her burial, on the one hand, is very sad because Yitzchak's not in her burial. Yeah. And maybe that's a topic for a different time because it's, it's a different parsha. It's not, mm -hmm. not the parsha that we're talking about. And then, but he shows up, he and Yishmael show up for Avram's burial. And yet I think that the, the fact that her burial is described as, you know, the Sadeh, Sher Kana, Avraham, it's, it's not described, it's a personal story in a national narrative. Yeah. And bring it back to that national narrative that that her death, which may have been lonely, it may have been sad, and yet it's elevated to this place of because of her, the Sada Asher Kana, you know, now we have Hebron and now we have this Chibor to Hebron for all eternity, for all the Imahot. And it's she's the, she has this, you know, it's like kind of like Rachel has an afterlife, like Kolber Amani Shmar Chamavakalbana. So Sarah has this afterlife of like the 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 I don't want to say that, but but her personality or her you know, when even when it ends on the uh, Olam Hazet piece, it continues because because of her. You know, we have we have Hebron, we we have that that connection, um, and and it's a lonely death, but it's it's the least lonely death because how many people today go to Hebron to connect to them? Yeah. So she may have died lonely, but but her our connection to her today is eternal. I think um, it kind of brings me also to our current moment where we are because i think that even people who think of themselves as just like the regular folk right now i think many people are asking themselves this question i'm speaking specifically in israel at the moment of like what am i doing for am israel right now i think that this question of like what's my existence on the national plane is something that people are thinking about in the case of sarah and avraham they know from the moment god addresses avraham that their lives are on two simultaneous stages. They're aware of the fact, and I think it's true with all the Avot and Imahot, that what they do is not simply for their own benefit or life. For many of us, you know, regular people today, that's not always clear to us. It's not always clear to us that our life needs to exist on two different planes. I do think that in the past year, I, I will say that in the small world that I am engaged in in my life here, many people speak about Am Yisrael as a very real part of their life and the things they're trying to do and the way they're trying to contribute. But I think that even for people who that wasn't part of their natural language, 
in the past year, it's it's become much, much more of that, whether it's to be involved in what's happening or to go and fight for or to help others so that you can strengthen those who are fighting for, right? Everybody is sort of, I think, understands that that we are living in a time that we aren't just for ourselves. Now, I think that that's probably always true to a certain degree, but I think many of us have awakened to that reality in, in the past year. But Sarah, just like her life began with an individual plight of she doesn't have children, but very quickly we learned that that's a very big challenge for what is supposed to be their national role. Also, when she dies, she might have died on a personal level, as you say, alone. There might have been something kind of tragic to her death, but her but her death will take on national significance. That's going to be true of all the matriarchs and patriarchs. And that, that's what makes them, to me, so different than anybody else is that their life is this DNA for everything else that will come afterwards. We're constantly going to go back to these, these stories and understand what paradigms they're creating for our, our lives now. And I think that her life's it's it we're introduced to her on a on a i would say a sad tone and we end with her on a sad tone there's something consistent about that and it doesn't take away from her greatness right she says kulam and the first you know because she isn't just sarah she's sarah imenu and because she's sarah imenu this takes on much bigger significance And, and i'll just say i'm saying this seriously on a personal level that i think about this a lot when it comes to raising my children or i would say mostly that's where i think about it and sometimes that perspective like helps me. I think my kids are like the netzach. They're they're the they're the eternity idea, right? My kids, and please God, they'll have their children. And sometimes I think about that. I'll say, hey, get a hold of yourself. You're thinking a little bit too too narrow right now. Like this is an investment for the long term, right? Whenever people make comments about parenting that are like very in the here and now, like oh, it, it, like okay, like. But often what what saves me from like either getting lost in the here and now or sort of going getting too high in the here and now is to think about like this is a long term investment in like the like eternity of the Jewish people. It sounds like very intense. I don't do that like on a regular little fight with my kids, but I do think about it once in a while. Like I really, I really do. I think you have, and it, you can't. It's 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 a soundtrack that you can't avoid in yeah. this country in this time. Yeah. It's it's always there. Yeah, and that's why her, that's why when you know when her death is portrayed as you know Hasidash or cannot, and there is national significance to death even though it's a, a, a personal tragedy that one cannot even convey in words, that we're not going to convey in words. But maybe there's, maybe there's a hand-holding there from the, yeah. t- from the Torah, from the Tanakh. Of, of If I could be allowed to do this, that, um, so you mentioned, whose yard site is on the 11th of Cheshvan that you just mentioned? Uh, Rav uh, Moshe Chaim Lau. Right, Nachon. So Grand, Father of, chief, former chief rabbi, so grandfather. So this episode will also come out the week of my father's yard site, which is also on the 11th of Cheshvan. And I just want to say as like a total side note to my father, bef- well before he was, not actually, but what, before he was sick, he decided that he wanted to be buried in Israel. This was, there was like a group on in the shul of buying plots in Eretz Chaim. <laughs> in a, a group that doesn't exist anymore, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, and okay. and they sold the plots they had in the States and they bought plots here. Now, of course, we're both Machshava Belevi. She had no intention of using it within the coming year, but that's unfortunately what happened. But uh, it sounds so silly, but even like the choice and to be, while well, Rabbi Huda Levi would criticize this choice, the choice to be buried here is also, to me, makes my father's death part of a national story. I didn't grow up in Israel. This is not where their roots were. I'm the only one in my family who lives here. But like, to me, I like people always joke like, oh, do you have any family in Israel? I'm like, no, but my father is here <laughs> eternally. Beautiful. But yeah. but to me, it's it's very meaningful. Like meaning, it, first of all, it's meaningful because I know that that decision was swayed by the fact that they had a daughter who ended up moving here. But also it's a, it's an ideological decision to say like, this is where I'm, this is where I'm resting forever. And, and I think that, we can't always think about our decisions in terms of netzach, like it's a bit heavy and that's not how we function on a daily basis. But I, I agree with you that this past year, first of all, life is heavy. Like life is super heavy. Like if when you have a day that's not heavy, that's like it's the rough. exception. <laughs> uh, and so, and I do, and I will say that to me, this, this Am Yisrael piece has impacted and is impacting decisions that I've been making in my life. And and it's it's a humbling piece. It's also a piece that, that demands of us to do more than we sometimes think that we're capable of. And, and I'll, I'll add to that significance of Yeral of Cheshvan. I know we're talking about Sari Menu, but it is also the Yard site of Rachel Menu. Yeah. And her, the choice of her burial, of where that was. My father where, wanted good company on that Yard site. <laughs> he has it. <laughs> but the choice to, to bury her somewhere specifically there also gives national significance to, to, to her death, that she's on the road, right? Rachel Mivaka al Baneha, right? That yeah. it's for all, you know, Me'anali Hinachim. 
And that's where we're charged with. We're charged with, I know I don't want to go to Rachel, it's someone else's topic, but we're charged with me we, and to forever cry, right? Yeah. To forever mourn. The death doesn't stop the relationship. It just, it, re, it stops a certain part of the relationship, but, but we, we continue that obligation of connection. Okay, so Michal, we, we have to wind down our episode, but I know okay. that in your heart, in there heart. is uh, another, another Sarah there is. who was very, very close to your heart. And I, I guess kind of as we wind down today, I wanted you to bring her into the conversation as well. First of all, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so <laughs> grateful for that because it's someone that has impacted all of our lives, including where we, including where we are yeah. and what, what's going on behind us and all these women learning Torah, that uh, I think her role in history has some, some gotten a little bit, uh, she doesn't have the glory that she deserves. Um, and that is Sarah Schneer. Sarah Schneer, who, who is known as the founder of the Beis Yaakov movement. But there's something in that sentence that's almost not fair because so many yeah. Jewish women and from women and, and not, and, or women who are connected to Torah who aren't part of the Beis Yaakov movement. So when you hear that affiliation, you're like, oh, that, that's not me. But Sarah Schneer, without getting into her whole biography, but I can recommend uh, some books if anyone is interested. She didn't wake up in the morning and someone opened the Beis Yaakov. She started a woman's Torah learning that was later by the Aguda named the Beis Yaakov. And that's what it became when it became. But the impact that Sarah Schneer's individual contribution of teaching girls Torah in Krakow, in, in a way, not just she gave it to our Torah and not just she gave a shir. What was different about her was experiential education that we all have today of, of tishes and Friday nights together and chagim together and all the stuff that girls were lacking. And it feels strange to talk about her. You know, I, when I go to Poland, we, we spend hours at our kever and talking about her and I'm spending Shabbos in the Beis Yaakov building in a month from now uh, with my students. I'm like, you know, we've got 25 hours and that's not enough for me. But she also didn't have children. And yet, they, and, and, and yet she is so much, almost, I want to say single-handedly, but responsible for the Torah. The Torah learn that we do in, 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 a, in an institutionalized way throughout mm -hmm. the world. Right? At her death, the amount of schools and the amount of girls that were learning, it was in the thousands, tens of thousands. And they called her Mama Sarah. Right? And, they, you know, and there are those that may suggest different reasons for why they called her Mama Sarah. Maybe she didn't have her own children, so they wanted her to feel that. But I do believe that there is a connection there to the Sarah Imenu. That's the mother that we have. That's the mother that we know of. That's someone who had, who struggled and also introduced someone who didn't have children. But that didn't prevent her from having an vision. impact, from having a vision, from having not only a dream, but an ability to, to act on that dream, an ability to do what needed to be do, the steps that needed to be. It wasn't overnight. It was, it was a long struggle. It was, it was complicated. But, but we all owe such a debt of a karasatov. To a woman, again, who, because, mo two reasons. A, because she's affiliated with one movement, but also the majority of her students, I would say even maybe 100% of her students in the 1930s ended up in the Shoah. Um, because she, she died in 1935. She died right before the Shoah. Mm -hmm. But her students, most of them were victims of Nazi occupation. So a lot of her students didn't survive. Wow. So a lot of those stories have mm -hmm. disappeared with... Uh, Did any of them survive? Yes, yes, yes. The most right. famous one is, is Pearl Banish. Um, okay. A few of them survived. Um, but if one is one, you know, Pearl Banish was Sarah, Sarah, Sarah Schneer's, uh, one of her students, and she wrote a book called Carry Me in Your Heart. And she also wrote a book called To Vanquish the Dragon, which is the story of oh, the Beis yeah. of girls in yeah. the Shoah. Yeah. Um, she's one of the, I would say, primary testimonies about it. Yeah. But I think, you know, if I have, if you're going to give me a few more minutes to pay tribute to someone who, as I always famous to my students, so, you know, girls always had a connection to Hashem. Their mothers, their, their, their homes, their this, but they never went to shul. They never, they never sat in class learning Torah. But when Sarah Schneer opened it in, first in her living room, she didn't open an institution and then later became an institution. But when she brought women together to learn Torah, and she enabled them the, the gift and the destiny and the privilege of living Torah together, of learning Torah together, and of loving Torah together, which did not exist as a chever before that. You, know, you sit in Matana, and right behind us, there's all these women coming to learn Torah and you know, drinking coffee before that and connecting. And we stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, we are so privileged in our generation to have giants of education, giants of women's Torah learning here more than anywhere else. But, but it comes from someplace, and, and it came from that dream that was turned into reality. So when we talk about Sarai Menu, which is you know, what, we're, what we're here to talk about, um, throughout Jewish history, there, have been, there is another Sarah um, who was called Mama Sarah, who, who, loved, who, who loved the idea of teaching Torah, um, of spreading Torah to, uh, to, to other women. So, so Hakara Satov, you know, even the fact that you and I are sitting together discussing that, you know, that we have opportunities that we haven't had before, um, and that we both come from the Tami Drush that are so focused on women and, and what, you know, we're used to the Migdal O's or Matan and I'm Joshua Borya and Mechomayan where the Chavaya of being together with your students is like nothing else. A hundred years ago, they didn't have that. If you wanted to learn Torah, maybe you learned Chumash with your father on Friday night. That was, that was what you had. 
so so that gift um that gift that i think we need to keep reminding ourselves of and to have that akar satov and bring awareness at every opportunity that we have that um it's crazy to me that she had such a such a sort of so many women learning torah and she never had children so there's never no one ever said kaddish for her right yeah. which is a crazy thing so mm-hmm. all of our torah learning is the kaddish that was never set for her because wow. that that's 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 what her continuity was so that's a different mama sara different mm-hmm. sorry menu michal i want to thank you for being here today Man, i'm not even done there's so much more to say but i thank and, you for the opportunity to do this yes um, and for illuminating the the figure of sarah really i think through through all the different narratives that we that we meet her in and uh, i think i definitely feel much more moved and connected honestly Ooh. to who uh to who sarah Emanu is so i really well, appreciate that i hope so and you giving me the opportunity to the podcast gave me another chance to dig a little bit deeper than i would have okay. um so thank you for that shabbat shalom shabbat shalom Thanks for listening to this week's episode from Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. If you would like to sponsor an episode, please contact the Matan office or email me at podcast.matan.org.il. Please do us and all women's Torah learning a favor and share this episode with all of your friends and family. 